Pittsburgh, Kansas on March 9, 1945, Dennis Lynn Rader was the eldest of four children. His upbringing in Wichita, the city he would later terrorize, was characterized by humble circumstances. From an early age, Rader exhibited violent tendencies, allegedly engaging in the torture and hanging of animals. In a 2005 interview, he confessed to experiencing sexual fantasies that were probably weirder than other people's. Rader described binding his hands and ankles with rope and covering his head with a bag, practices he would later use on his victims. He collected magazine images of women he found attractive, drawing ropes and gags on them, and fantasizing about restraining and controlling them. Despite his inner turmoil, Rader maintained a facade of normalcy, attending college before dropping out and enlisting in the U.S. Air Force. BTK was born. Upon returning home from military service, he became an electrician in Wichita. Through church, he met Paula Dietz, a bookkeeper at Snacks Convenience Store. After a brief courtship, he proposed, and they married in 1971. In 1973, Rader lost his job as an electrician. Shortly after, on January 15, 1974, he committed his first murder. While his wife Paula slept, Dennis Rader entered the Otero family home and murdered all its occupants. The children, 11-year-old Josie and 9-year-old Joseph, were forced to witness the strangulation of their parents. As Rader strangled her mother, Josie cried out, Mommy, I love you. He then dragged her to the basement, removed her underwear, and hanged her from a sewer pipe. Her final words were a plea for her fate. Her killer, composed and unmoved, replied, Well, honey, you're going to be in heaven tonight with the rest of your family. Observing the girl's struggle and eventually succumbing to death, Dennis Rader derived pleasure and documented the scene through photographs. He also kept some of the young girl's undergarments as a keepsake from what was his initial act of carnage. Once he had satisfied his twisted desires, Rader returned to his normal life, preparing to attend church where he served as the council president. Dennis Rader's domestic life with Paula Dietz amidst his criminal acts. As Dennis Rader, also known as the BTK killer, brutally murdered a family, his wife, Paula Dietz, was planning to start a family of her own. Only a few months later, Rader took the lives of his next victims, a young college student named Catherine Bright. At the time, Paula was three months pregnant with Rader's first child and was unaware that her husband had already begun to subtly boast about his crimes. He had left a letter detailing the Oteros murders inside an engineering book at the Wichita Public Library and had contacted the Wichita Eagle to reveal its location. He also announced his intention to kill again and adopted the pseudonym BTK, which stood for his preferred method, bind, torture, and kill. Rader reportedly took a break from his murder spree after Paula informed him that she was expecting, stating that he was so excited for us and our folks. We were now a family. With a job and a baby, I got busy. However, this reprieve only lasted a few short years, and the BTK killer claimed another victim in 1977. Before Shirley Vian became his seventh victim, Paula discovered an early draft of a poem called Shirley Locks, in which Raider had written, Thou shalt not scream, but lay on cushion and think of me in death. Despite finding this chilling poem and noticing that the BTK killer's letters contained the same spelling errors as her husband's, Paula did not confront Raider about these suspicious findings. Instead, she merely teased him gently, saying, You spell just like BTK. Despite the sealed box he kept hidden in their home, she refrained from inquiring about its contents. Curiosity never compelled her to attempt a glimpse inside. Had she done so, she would have discovered a macabre treasure trove, a mother load, as Raider called it. Inside lay chilling mementos from his BTK crime scenes. The undergarments of his victims, their driver's licenses, and disturbing photographs of Raider himself, adorned in their lingerie. Reenacting the horrors he had inflicted upon them, including choking and mock burials, Part of my modus operandi was to acquire and preserve the victim's underwear, Raider confessed in an interview. In my fantasies, I would relive the day or embark on new ones. Despite these revelations, Raider's wife would later adamantly maintain to the authorities that Dennis Raider was a good man, a wonderful father. He would never harm anyone.
The double persona of Dennis Rader, the BTK's hidden family life. Despite his heinous crimes, Dennis Rader's family remained unaware of his true nature. To them, he was a devout Christian. Carrie Rawson, Rader's daughter, recalled a disturbing incident where her father had violently grabbed her brother by the neck. However, such episodes seemed isolated. When the BTK killer emerged, it was Raider himself who provided solace to his family during their anxious nights. Raider maintained a friendly demeanor, waving each morning to 53-year-old Marine Hedge as he made his way to church. When Hedge became the BTK killer's eighth victim, Raider expressed concern and reassurance to his family. Unbeknownst to them, Raider had committed the murder the previous night, sneaking away from a Cub Scout retreat he was chaperoning. He returned to the group of boys in the morning, leaving no trace of his sinister actions. In 1986, Raider claimed another victim, 28-year-old Vicky Weggerly. Her murder remained unsolved until Raider's own actions inadvertently led to his arrest. Dennis Raider, the BTK serial killer, unmasked after three decades. Dennis Raider settled into a domestic life and secured employment in 1991 as a compliance supervisor for Park City, a suburb of Wichita. He was known for his meticulous and unforgiving approach with clients. In the same year, he committed his final crime, the tenth in his series. Raider broke into the home of 62-year-old Dolores Davis, a grandmother living near his own family, using a cinder block to shatter a sliding glass door. He disposed of her body by a bridge. During his last year of freedom, Raider encountered an article in a local newspaper marking the anniversary of the Otero murders. Seeking to revive the BTK killer's notoriety, he sent numerous taunting letters and packages to media outlets and law enforcement in 2004. These communications included mementos from his crimes, such as bound and gagged dolls resembling his victims. One package even contained a proposal for an autobiography titled The BTK Story. Ultimately, a letter sent on a floppy disk proved to be his undoing. Metadata from a deleted Microsoft Word document revealed that the document had been authored by the President of the Christ, Lutheran Church, Dennis Rader. DNA samples obtained from one of his victim's fingernails and a match with his daughter's pap smears confirmed Rader's identity. On February 25, 2005, he was apprehended from his home in front of his family. Despite his efforts to maintain a reassuring demeanor, he embraced his daughter one last time, assuring her that the situation would be resolved. In the police vehicle, Raider displayed no remorse. When questioned about the reason for his arrest, he responded with a chilling smirk, I have my suspicions. During his trial, Raider confessed to all ten murders, relishing in the gruesome details of his victims' deaths. He was sentenced to 175 years without parole, narrowly avoiding the death penalty due to Kansas's lack of capital punishment during his May 17, 2024 reign of terror. The BTK Killer's Capture, the Aftermath for a Shattered Family Upon Dennis Rader's arrest, his wife Paula Deeds abandoned her unfinished meal on the dinner table, never to return. Haunted by the horrifying revelation of Rader's crimes, Deeds vowed to never enter the family home again. She subsequently divorced Raider following his confession. The Raider family maintained silence during the trial, unable to comprehend the motivations behind his heinous actions. Raider himself offered the cryptic explanation, I actually think I may be possessed with demons. The media alleged that Paula Deeds concealed her knowledge, shielded her husband, and disregarded the evidence. BTK's daughter initially harbored intense hatred towards him, particularly after he wrote a letter to the newspaper referencing her, stating, She resembles me. The children recognized their shared bloodline with their father, and the possibility that a part of him resided within them. They also realized that if their father had been apprehended after his first murder, they would not exist. It's incredibly unsettling, Carrie remarked. There's almost a sense of guilt for being alive. They passed away. You survived. However, the most challenging aspect was that despite his actions, Dennis Rader remained their father. Should I inform you that I adored you growing up, that you were the light of my life? Carrie wrote in her memoir, A Serial Killer's Daughter, I merely wished you were seated beside me in the theater, sharing a tub of buttered popcorn, but you're not. You won't ever experience
experience this again, she wrote to her father. Was it worth it? I'd like to take this time to pay my respects to the victims and all the families that were affected by these heinous acts on both sides. You deserved better and are forever in our prayers. May you rest in peace. Conclusion Family members of offenders often feel guilt and shame for their loved one's actions. Offenders may face fines, legal fees, and imprisonment, which can put a financial burden on their families. Family members of offenders may be stigmatized and ostracized by their community. Incarceration or other legal consequences can disrupt family relationships and lead to a loss of contact. Crime has devastating consequences that extend beyond the immediate victims and offenders. It tears families apart, inflicts emotional and financial pain, and perpetuates a cycle of violence and disadvantage. Addressing the root causes of crime and providing support to both victims and offenders is crucial for breaking this destructive cycle and creating safer and healthier communities. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe for more Killer Cliff Notes, and I'll see you in the next one.